Hello and welcome to the 17th edition of the Next Man Up podcast. My name is Logan Wortman and I'm recording this on February 16th, which is actually the last day that fan voting is open for the All-Star Game. So that's going to be the main topic we're going to be covering today and talk about, you know, everybody that I think should be on the All-Star team this year, kind of flesh out that whole roster, even though, you know, fan voting right now is only for uh, the starters and it's actually going to be the coaches from across the league who vote on the reserves that are going to make up the bench unit for the all-star game. But yeah, I'm I'm just going to fully flesh out my entire roster for both the Eastern and Western conference who I, who I think should be all-stars this year. Uh, The reasons why probably going to be a lot of discussion also, because I haven't really completely decided um, towards the bottom of the rosters uh, who I really want to be in there. Uh, So probably going to be some decision-making as I go along (laughs) talking about the different guys' cases. So yeah. But before we get into it, I should mention that uh, the Nuggets and the Celtics are actually playing right now as I'm recording this. It's a very depleted Nuggets squad versus, I think, fully healthy Celtics. Looks like, yeah, they got Kemba, Tatum, Brown, Thompson. Looks like they got just about the whole crew other than Marcus Smart, I guess, which is a pretty big piece. But it looks like, you know, Jokic is single-handedly keeping the Nuggets in the game so far uh, with 23 points with four minutes left to go in the second quarter. Um, Not a whole lot of help from anywhere else other than, you know, Murray has nine points, but that's just about it. Nobody else on the team has more than two points. So, um, yeah, this is going to be an interesting one. I'm going to definitely watch it uh, closely later after I'm done recording tonight. It'll be a good game to watch um, no matter the outcome. It's good to see those young guys getting run, um, like Zeke Naji, RJ Hampton, Marcus Howard's been getting some minutes in this game. Uh, you know, some of those guys that I'm pretty excited about moving forward. So, yeah, it'll be fun to see. Okay, so jumping into picking my all-star teams for this year. Starting in the East, I have a couple locks that I want to talk about really quick. So, you know, just guys that I think that are totally deserving of a all-star spot that it's basically a no-brainer. Don't even really need to dive in to talk about any of these guys' cases because of just how self-evident their production has been so far this season. So so the three front court players in the starting lineup, I think, you know, in this Eastern Conference, I'd be very, very shocked if these three guys weren't the starters uh, come, you know, March or whenever they're having the All-Star game. I believe it's early March. But so, you know, starting in the front court, I think there's going to be Joel Embiid, Kevin Durant, and Giannis and Tetacumpo. I think these three guys are are by far the three best front court players in the Eastern Conference, as well as just the best three players in general in the Eastern Conference this year. So um, all three of them, I think, are you know somewhat in the MVP race, up in up probably in the top eight. All three of them, I would say, maybe even top six, something like that. Um, that's something maybe I'll I'll talk about a little bit later in the episode. But yeah. Sixers are at the top of the East. Um, so Joel Embiid has, you know, definitely been the most dominant figure on their team. Um, Joel Embiid has been killing guys in the post this season, uh, finally surrounded by, you know, somewhat of a semblance of shooting around him um, with a competent coach knowing how to use him as well. Um, also, it seems like Joel Embiid is just fired up this season, probably just mad, you know, he didn't make all NBA last season. And I really like that, that, that stuff like that gets under his skin, motivates him makes him want to just go out and demolish the competition. Embiid is having a fantastic year, probably the front runner for MVP this season, if we're being honest, at this point. So yeah, no-brainer for Joel Embiid, finally playing the way that we all knew that he was capable of, being one of the most dominant players in the NBA, if not the most. So next up, we got KD. You know, he's been leading one of the most potent offenses in the league. You know, very star-studded team, obviously, but he's been right back to his former self for the most part, uh, you know, before that horrible Achilles injury in the 2019 NBA Finals. You know, one of the leading scorers uh, in the league, and he's been, you know, the the most important player on the defensive side of the ball for this Brooklyn Nets team. 
they've really needed his uh, just defensive capabilities, being very versatile uh, and elite in that department, um, which has come to a surprise. I was not expecting him to be, uh, you know, this close to his former self on the defensive end um, after a horrible injury like that. You know, I, I thought that maybe he could uh, recapture some of his production from before just on the offensive end being, you know, just that fluid of a score and shooter, not needing too much, you know, explosiveness, but yeah, on the defensive side of the, of the game, it doesn't seem like he slowed down much at all. So, um, and they've really need that, uh, this Brooklyn squad. Uh, so that's definitely a huge part of the reason why, um, you know, he's talked about the way he is this season as, uh, one of the best players throughout the entire league. Um, and so then next we got Giannis, uh, He's leading the Bucks, uh, you know, in the second spot in the Eastern Conference. You know, they it's not been a normal Milwaukee season um, as compared to the past couple. Been losing a pretty fair amount of games compared to, you know, where, what their pace is usually at win-loss wise. You know, I've heard some people say that Giannis's production has been, you know, the same level as it was last season, which it has not been, you know, uh, it's definitely a clear step down. Um if we're just talking about his, you know, MVP case so far, it's definitely much weaker, I'd say, than it was last season, which, you know, last season was one of the strongest cases for an MVP that we've ever seen. So, you know, it's not hard to uh, kind of fall short of that. <laughs> um, and then I would also say, which I don't, I, you know, I haven't heard many people comparing this season to his first MVP season two years ago. I think it might be even a little bit weaker of a case than that one, which, you know, still not saying much because I, th you know, I probably hold him much higher than league consensus does uh, for this season in the MVP, MVP race. You know, I hear people saying, even though, you know, he's production wise, he looks the same as he did last year. Um, there, nobody's going to vote for him because he can't win three years in a row. People aren't going to vote for somebody to win three uh, consecutive MVPs which I think is just stupid. Um, you know, I, I hear everybody say this, like even the people that I respect that I listen to all the time about basketball opinions, basketball takes, they say stuff like that all the time. And I, d I just don't understand it because they're the same type of people that talk about how they don't give into narrative and sentiment when they do all-star voting um, and, and stuff like that. They won't just vote, you know, MVP or all-star for somebody that they feel like should have won the award or been named an, named an all-star in the past. They want to make up for it. If they're having a good enough season or something or something like that, they give the edge. I, I just, I, I think that should just stay out of it because we're talking about production versus production in this single season. That's what the award is about and what, you know, the all-star game is about. Uh, so, you know, I, I do think that Giannis is one of the front runners for the MVP. I think he should be in the top five or six right now. Uh, which there's a lot of guys up there right now, um, but it'll be more separated as we move along. But yeah, he's definitely should be much higher up there than people are talking about him at the moment. People have basically written him off at this point as uh, just an impossible person to win the award. Um, and I, I, yeah, I just don't like the the logic of that very much. Um, and I also hear a lot of people, like tons of people saying, um, you know, that last year's MVP war award was a mistake. It should have gone to LeBron. LeBron showed that or whatever. And it's like be just because Giannis uh, and the Bucks crumpled in the playoffs, lost to the Miami Heat in the second round, and LeBron won his fourth ring. Um, and while, okay, like I at no point last season while, you know, voting for MVP, did I ever say that Giannis was a better player than LeBron or that Giannis is the new best player in the league or anything like that. If you would have asked me last season, I would have told you LeBron James is still the the best player in the league. Like, you know, at nut cutting time down in the NBA finals, when it really matters, who am I going to pick? If you would ask me that last season, I, I would have told you LeBron. I wasn't going to pick Giannis, but that's not what the MVP award is. <laughs> last season, Giannis had a much better MVP case than LeBron had. LeBron has been over the past several seasons been coasting. Uh, throughout the regular season, um, you know, undeniably uh, load managing through through games, like in the game has been taking lots of possessions off, just taking a little bit easier. 
been str- which is a strategy and it, it's working because he's doing it at the cost or at the benefit of his longevity at this point, you know, somewhat after his fourth, uh, MVP award, I want to say, uh, you know, when he kind of came back to the Cavs around then is really when it seemed like he started focusing more on longevity and on the postseason, much more than the regular season, um, which is fine, but don't, I hate that people use that as an excuse for why he should still win MVP because they're like, he, you know, cause come playoff time, he's, we all know he's still the best player. So we should just give him the regular season MVP. It's like, okay, no, but he's doing that, uh, you know, f- to, f- as a strategy for longevity, but he's doing it at the cost of his regular season production. So that has to hurt him when it comes to MVP voting, because that's just the way that works. Like, I'm sorry. You can't just be like, no, I'm not, I'm just going to take this off a little bit. You know, I'm, my production's going to slide a little bit, but you guys know I'm still, I'm still better than this, right? Like you, you guys still know that. So just still, you know, give me awards anyways. Like <laughs> it's just, I, I'm not saying I don't understand the thinking behind it, but it's just not what the MVP award is about. It's, you know, it's regular season production. That's what this award is for. So um, I, ju- I just don't like the apologists on this subject who keep keep backtracking and saying LeBron should have 10 MVPs at this point because he's just he's the best player every year. While I don't disagree with that over the past decade and a half, he has been the best player in the league, you know, th- throughout all those 15 years. The only time he really dropped out of that spot, I think, on ESPN was in 2019 after the Lakers season that they didn't make the playoffs, the first Lakers season that he was with them, which is understandable. But I'm, I'm just saying he was the consensus number one player in the league, like, and I don't disagree with that at all. But should he have won MVP every season? No. He didn't win in 2011 because the Heat went up, were off to a very slow start. Um, and, you know, Dwight Howard, Derrick Rose were both very, very good candidates. Derrick Rose ended up winning. Dwight Howard, I believe, got second. Um, that's really the the main, the top one that I could see you argue, making a point, you know, making an argument for he should have won that one. But, you know, if he wins that one and you, you do your revisionist history over all these awards, 2009 is a very, is a very controversial one. Like very well could have gone to D Wade in 2009 was a very, very, very strong candidate. Um, lots of, lots of people doing revisionist history might give the edge to Dwayne Wade in a recount in that one. So if we're going to do, you know, the ones that he didn't win, we kind of got to do all of them. So is four, four MVPs the right amount for LeBron James thus far in his career? I'd say it's about like four or five. Like just point to me what seasons he should have won instead. People, some people say 2015, but I, I just disagree with that. Steph Curry, I think, had the clear edge. 2016, nobody disagrees with Steph Curry winning MVP that season. Um, some people want to point out, you know, James Harden um, in 2018, and then Giannis the past couple seasons, which, like, if you're if you're going to do revisionist history on those ones, I'm I'm just telling you, you're going to see his regular season production not up to par with those other candidates that won that those seasons. Yeah, come playoff time, he bested them. He was, you know, he outlasted them. He got to the finals. He won a couple of those years. Well, one of them, 2020, 2020 last season. But that doesn't mean that he should have won regular season MVP. So let's please stop doing this. <laughs> uh, let's let's keep the award what it is, please. Um, yeah, that was a very, very long tangent. Uh, I'm supposed to be talking about Giannis right now. Um but that was something that I just kind of wanted to talk about a little bit because I've been a little irritated this season hearing uh, that topic talked about uh, throughout lots of podcasts. So maybe I should start calling these solo episodes that I'm doing just rants with Logan or something like that. But I know that I kind of get off on on things I just want to spew out and get off my chest. But um, I also just kind of wanted to bring that up because you know, defending Giannis a little bit, you know, I'm talking about his all-star case. So kind of just went that way. But, you know, I I hear a lot of people just kind of bringing down Giannis's value, uh, you know, kind of his market value amongst NBA fans, um, just the way people talk about him now, or don't talk talk about him at all. Um, You know, I've heard on a couple podcasts done by The Ringer recently, 
like people say stuff like Chris Middleton is the most important player on the Bucks and things like that. Like, don't get me wrong, Chris Middleton's great. We're going to talk about him in a little bit, but I, it's you know, Giannis Antetokounmpo is still one of the most dominant figures in the league, uh, one of the most unstoppable guys um, in transition. Yeah, clearly he has his flaws um, and shortcomings when it comes to how you're going to build a championship roster around him. Um, but as far as, you know, getting it done in the regular season and um, putting up stats and putting up W's, you know, he's still among the best of them, even this season, uh, which I think is a little bit of a drop off as compared to two years ago and definitely a drop off as compared to last year. Uh, so I don't blame anybody for not voting for him for MVP this season, you know, because he has a weaker case than some of the other guys. But what I do have a problem with is comparing it to his last couple seasons and saying since because he didn't have a as good of a season this year as he did last year, that that is somehow a reason why he shouldn't win it this year. You know, is he in competition with the Giannis from last year to an MVP this year? No, the you know, the field changes every year. The, the, the case, the candidates change every single season. So he's up against this year's candidates uh, for the MVP. So I'd like to see him compare to those people's. Uh, cases uh, rather than his own from from the last couple seasons also I get voter fatigue I understand it you know coming into this year it's not like I want Giannis to win his third straight MVP um, especially if he keeps coming up short in the playoffs it's, it's kind of frustrating but you can't that's not you can't use those things as reasons to just be like make yourself feel comfortable or okay with not voting for him you have to let you know I don't know and I hear these things from plenty of people who have these votes, who, who actually vote on these things in NBA media. And it's just kind of bothersome. So people don't, don't know how to remove all sorts of biases like that. Um, biases? Biases? I don't know. But anyways, Giannis, one of the most dominant paint presences this season, uh, creating tons of three-point shots. For, you know, all the, those guys around the arc, like Chris Middleton, like even Drew Holiday, whose three-point percentage is up from years past. Um, Dante DiVincenzo, who's been having somewhat of a breakout year. Uh, Brooke Lopez, you know, all, the, all, those, all those guys that you'd expect. Um, Bucks just are not quite as deep as they have been the last couple seasons, I would say, uh, which is one of the biggest reasons why they're hurting, um, I think. So... But Bucks still the, one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, uh, and Giannis is one of the best players in the Eastern Conference. Definitely gets an All Star starter lock. But I do put him behind Embiid for sure right now. Him and KD are kind of a toss up for me at this point. Um, you know, when we're talking about All Star voting, even MVP candidacy, uh, they're somewhere in the same range. But yeah, these three for sure. And then moving on, uh, we have Bradley Beal is my other guy that I think, you know, is just a lock. Like, I'm not even going to be discussing kind of arguments for where else he could land on this. You know, that's kind of what this section is that I'm, I'm doing right now. They don't really have an argument to end up anywhere else <laughs> uh, than where I have them right now on the all-star ballot. And, um, you know, my make up all-star ballot that is just in Excel. Uh, in a spreadsheet but um Bradley Beal uh yeah is my starting guard on the all-star team my main one he's the only one that's a lock for me right now uh before I really dive into these um you know he's leading the league in scoring by a pretty pretty safe margin he's at like 33 or 34 points a game I believe um you know he's just taken another level up or taken another step up from last season uh in production for sure um you know, I don't know about, you know, as a total complete player, his skill set and everything, because he, I think his team is just even worse than it was last season, which has come as a big surprise. Um, you know, they're, they haven't really lost many people from last season, but they have been dealing with a lot of injuries, especially with like Thomas Bryant and Russell Westbrook um, and, you know, things like that. Davis Bertans has been cold this far this season. Scott Brooks seems like he just went from a not that good coach to a horrible coach, uh, you know, just across uh, off season. So I don't know um, if he's going to be staying in Washington this year. He seems like he's loyal. 
uh, to, to the team, you know, in what he says publicly, but I have no idea. I know that he's definitely frustrated uh, with being one of the worst teams in the NBA this season, despite being as good as he is, one of the best, I'd say, the best shooting guard in the league right now, other than maybe James Harden. Um, and also Luca, if you want to throw him in there as a shooting guard. But still, that's tremendous elite company. Um, but yeah, so that brings me into, you know, my discussion for who should start at the other guard position because I have the four starters kind of solidified uh, in this Eastern Conference. Um, and so, you know, the first candidate I kind of already mentioned uh, is James Harden. That's my first candidate that I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, for this spot. You know, he's been having an interesting year. A lot of people I've heard have kind of knocked him out of contention for the starting spot just because of his, um, you know, shenanigans that happened earlier this season where he was kind of just taking games off, uh, showed up to pr uh, training camp late and overweight and all, all these things, not, you know, not taking stuff seriously, but you know, that gives into narrative a little bit. Um, and I, I just try to steer clear of that. So if we're talking about his on court production, he's definitely been very, very good. Um, it's very, very different than a normal James Harden season. His scoring numbers are way down, way, way, way down. Uh, but he's made up for it in other areas. Um, he's still been very efficient, 64% true shooting percentage, uh, with, you know, shooting splits of 37, 47 and 89. Um, you know, so he's, he's getting to the line pretty, uh, pretty good. Not as, not as good as years past, but still like 8.9 free throw attempts per 100 possessions. So not a bad rate at all, but assists. This is where it really comes into play. Uh, his the way his game has changed this season. He's averaging 11.2 assists per game, which is uh, leading the league, and he's averaging 14 uh, assists per 100 possessions, which I I think is also leading the league. So yeah, been a very tremendous passer. Has had the ball in his hands quite a bit. Um, but it doesn't stay there very often. It seems like in Brooklyn, he's been much more of a swing man, uh, kind of, you know, drives and kicks a lot more than he used to even, uh, not doing a ton of pick and roll since he's been in Brooklyn. It's happened a little bit, but it's, it's a very different game for James Harden right now. He's kind of fitting, fitting into a new different role. And I, I kind of like it. It's, it's very different. Um, his usage is way down from what it's been in years past. He's at a usage rating of 26. So it's, very different uh, than, you know, the guys where we've been talking about. Like Bradley Beal, for example, his usage rate uh, is 36.5 this season. So much more than what James Harden's is at. Um, but that's not a bad thing, you know. It's just, that just means how often the ball is in that player's hands, How you know, how often he's being used on the offensive end while he's in the game. Um, so for James Harden to be averaging 11.2 assists per game on a usage of 26 um, is very, very impressive uh, and very odd also. But, you know, with those assists come turnovers. He's averaging uh, 5.3 per 100. That's 4.3 per game. Um, and he's been leading the league in minutes also, 37.8 per game. Um, so, yeah, James Harden is a very solid candidate for this spot. Uh, I'm kind of leaning towards him, I think, but uh, let's get to a couple of the other guards out here in the Eastern Conference. Jalen Brown is the main other one that uh, we're going to talk about, which he's listed at guard for the All-Star ballot for some reason. I mean, like, I don't totally disagree with it, but I just think it's weird that the, how they choose which players end up in diff each category. You know, like, a lot of times when they the Celtics go smaller uh, and, you know, they roll out a lineup of Kemba, Smart, Tatum Brown and Tice or Thompson, you know, whoever at the five, usually Brown is the one that's guarding the fours. Uh, they're kind of playing as the four guarding the bigger guys. But then at the same time, if there's a more elite, uh, smaller player that smart can't really be on because, you know, smarts out or something, you know, something or other Brown usually guards th the smaller guys more than Tatum does. So Brown just has a wider range of the guys that he defends um, so I could see how he gets fit into different positions, like how, how you could say he's more of a guard than Tatum is, but I could also see how, how you could say he's more of a forward than Tatum is. So it's, it's really weird. Um, 
but you know he's listed as guard here, so that's just the way, way we're going to be thinking about him. Uh, you know, he's been having a breakout season, like uh, averaging 26 points per game, uh, and that's 38.2 per 100, uh, which is a lot. Forgot to mention before, Bradley Beal's been averaging 43.3 points per 100, which is like Jordan level. Um, and it's almost what Giannis was at last season, which is also Jordan level. That's like very, very few players have ever, ever really get into that range per 100 in the mid 40s. Uh, but, you know, Jordan did, did a, a quite a few times. Uh, that's why I kind of call it, call it that. Great. If you're up there with the greatest score of all time, you know, per possession, that's, uh, that's pretty tremendous. So, and that's Bradley Beal that's doing that. But Jalen Brown, uh, shooting splits of 41, 51, 75. Uh, on a true shooting percentage of 60. So very efficient uh, this year as well. His playmaking is, has gone up a, a little bit, 3.4 per game, 5 per 100. Um, rebounding has been, you know, the good rate, everything like that. He's been playing pretty good defense. Um, his usage is way up from wh- where it's been at years past. Um, and, you know, it's at 31.4% usage rating. Um, so that's been, it's been very odd, but... You know, it's it's very understandable why, uh, you know, missing Kemba throughout most of the, the beginning of the season and then also loss of Gordon Hayward, who was a big time ball handler for them in their offense uh, the past couple of years, even though, you know, he kind of underperformed for what his expectations were. Gordon Hayward still handled the ball a lot and was a pretty big playmaker in their offense. So they've their offense has definitely hurt with Gordon Hayward uh, leaving. And that's, you know, kind of the hole that we've seen. The uh, Celtics dig uh, this season really just been struggling to create offensively, um, especially in the games that Kemba has has missed. So, but you know Jalen Brown has been keeping them afloat um, along with Jason Tatum. But that that leap that Brown has taken has th- this season production wise, Brown and Tatum are pretty much neck and neck. I'd say for the Celtics' best player this season. So, um, yeah, very very good from Brown. Uh, he's a deserving candidate as well. Uh, Zach Levine. Malcolm Brogdon, um, Kyrie Irving are uh, some other guys that, you know, you might want to throw in there. But I think I'm just going to give the edge to James Harden right now as the backcourt starter. You know, it's I think he does deserve it as much as, you know, people might not want to give it to him. Um, even me at times, I'm not the biggest James Harden fan, but, you know, can't really argue with the production. So. But I, it's not like I don't think anybody can make a, J, a Jalen Brown argument, you know, kind of throwing defense a little bit more into it if they wanted to. But Harden's actually been really solid on the defensive end this season, and Brown has actually been a, uh, a little bit down defensively uh, compared to where he's been at in years past. Um, it's really on the offensive end that Brown has taken that huge leap. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to stick with Harden. But, yeah, so Jalen Brown, I'm going to throw in there as a lock for the bench unit. So, yeah, for starters, we got – Two backcourt spots and three frontcourt spots uh, that we have filled now with Bradley Beal, James Harden, KD, Giannis, and Embiid. And so on the bench, we have the same layout again with two backcourt players, three frontcourt players, and we have two wildcard spots that you know any position can fit into. And so I'm going to throw Jalen Brown in there as the first guard on the bench. And then for the next guard uh, coming off our bench, you know, we got Zach Levine, like I talked about, who's been having a tremendous season scoring-wise, 28.1 points per game uh, on 43-52-86 splits um, with 65% true shooting. That's, what I think, amongst the most efficient uh, scores in the entire NBA right now. So definitely worth looking at Zach Levine. He's been shooting 11 threes per 100 possessions, which is the most out of anybody we're going to be looking at in this Eastern Conference right now. And that's a lot. So, and he's been hitting, you know, 43% of them, which is, it's been, it's been a step up for sure. Usage usage percentage at 30.4. I just feel like Zach Levine is having a much better season this year than people want to talk about. Like, then people are really you know, letting, letting come to him. But there, you know, there's other people as well that we should probably touch on, uh, for the spot and just not going to give it right away to Zach Levine. We also got Malcolm Brogdon who earlier this year, I probably would have had over Zach Levine for this position. But ever since that Victor Oladipo trade Brogdon, as well as Sabonis, who we'll, we'll also touch on, 
their production has kind of just fallen a little bit without Victor Oladipo. Their overall numbers have kind of slid, uh, really kind of missing that ball handling, shot creating presence that Oladipo provided. Um, and so, you know, I think the Pacers desperately need Levert to come back because, um, get, you know, get back healthy. You know, he's that piece that they got in the Oladipo trade. Um, he should be able to replicate a lot of that shot creating and ball handling capabilities and really help this Pacers team a lot. They also need to get, you know, TJ Warren, you know, their whole squad just back to, you know, good health uh, and back in the game. And I think this Pacers team is a very interesting team um, to deal with. Miles Turner has been a, just a great uh, defensive presence, um, as well as, you know, he's been shooting three pretty well as well. So, um, but Malcolm Brogdon, you know, he's been, the, he was, I feel like, the leader of this backcourt before, even when they had Oladipo uh, for the mar- most part. But yeah, without that other backcourt presence to kind of be his partner in crime, he's kind of slid a little bit. So I might just kind of cross him out. Uh, here, as much as I love Malcolm Brogdon, um, I, th- I, don't, I don't think he's going to make the cut over Zach Levine. So, this next guy, Kyrie Irving, um, he's only played 19 games. That's kind of where he falls a little bit, which is actually the same amount as KD, but KD is production wise, I think, made up for it. Not to say Kyrie hasn't, but I guess we'll, we'll get into it. Scoring wise, has been really good 27.6 points per game. Uh, that's 36.7 per 100. Uh, his shooting splits are 41, 53, 95. A true shooting percentage of 64%. So super mega efficient as well. Very similar to Zach Levine's numbers, except, you know, I think he's leading the league in free throw rate uh, or in free throw percentage at this point with 95%. You know, he's not getting to the line a lot, though. Only 5.7 per 100, which, you know, that actually that, it's a not bad number at all, but not as much as some of these other guys we're talking about. Like Zach Levine is at about 7 per 100. So um, he has a little bit of the edge there, but um, his usage is a little bit lower than Zach Levine's, but, you know, he's, he's on the better team uh, this season with more guys to share the ball with as well. So that's a really tough one uh, between Irving and Levine at this point for me, but, you know, we'll keep moving. Drew Holiday is a guy that I've seen talked about a lot more than I was expecting for All-Star. Um, and I really like that because I'm a big Drew Holiday guy. I'm also a big defensive guy. I like throwing in, you know, those guys that people just kind of skim over because their offensive numbers don't really look as good as some of the other guys's. But defensively and, look, you know, looking at the advanced stats, Drew, Drew Holiday's just been, I, I you know, on level, on the same level as some of these other guys we're talking about. Um, you know, Levine ha- and Irving have both been not super great defensively, especially Levine. Uh, Drew Holiday is I, I want to say the best defensive guard in the Eastern Conference for sure um, other than maybe Marcus Smart but this season I'd say it's definitely Drew Holiday scoring's not bad 16.4 per game 23.8 uh, per 100 uh, you know he's on a team with Giannis and Chris Middleton so he's kind of been taking the third wheel in terms of scoring three point percentage has been pretty good this year 39 uh, he's been 50 from the field 79 from the line and 59% true shooting um, so pretty efficient as well. Steals, though, uh, he's been among the leaders in the league in steals uh, with 2.8 per 100. That's up there with Jimmy Butler and I believe with Larry Nance and Ben Simmons as well. But yeah, he's been taking really tough assignments guarding backcourt players as well as frontcourt players like LeBron, some possessions and, and people like that. You know, that's been kind of the story of Drew Holiday, being a guard that has to defend like literally everybody on the court. So yeah, I, I don't I don't mind throwing Drew Holiday in this discussion one bit. I think he's a very, very worthy candidate. Um a couple other guys I just want to mention really quick. Trey Young, you know, he's definitely fallen a little bit. He's kind of having a you know, junior year slump if you want to call it that. And, you know, the Hawks haven't been great this season. Uh his scoring numbers have been a little bit down and he's been pretty awful defensively as well, not really seeing any improvement there. Um, which is where, you know, we kind of have wanted him to improve uh, coming into this season. So, yeah, I'm kind of just going to disqualify uh, Trey Young, scratch him off this list right now, even though, you know, he's still having a, a good season. I don't think it's on the levels as some of these other guys were talking about. Uh, Colin Sexton is another guy I just want to mention because, you know, he's been having a breakout year. Um, but, you know, I don't see him having quite the level of a year to really get him over the hump uh, in terms of, uh, talking about some of these other guys, you know, 
the Cavs have been a pleasant surprise, been a pretty competent team, actually. Um, and, you know, Colin Sexton has been a huge part of that. Uh, he's been on fire from 342%. Um, so playmaking hasn't been really there quite yet. But, he, man, he's got the confidence uh, to really go at you uh, down the stretch on offense. Um, really been taking it to defenders. Just been, been winning some pretty big games in crunch time. So uh, just guy I wanted to throw in here. I'm not going to cross him off the board quite yet. But I do think he's going to be behind Levine and uh, Kyrie and possibly Drew Holiday as well when we're really getting into it. And then for guards, we also got Ben Simmons, I guess. If we're, Yeah, if we're throwing him in the backcourt, which I'm okay. You know, for those of you that have listened to my podcast uh, in the past, you might have remembered maybe that uh, I kind of had a rant when we were doing the All-NBA teams at the end of last season um, that Ben Simmons was only listed as a guard for everything and how I, I thought that he should not be listed as a guard. He should be listed as for, as a forward. I, I, I kind of apologize for that um, because, you know, the main reasoning I was using was I was saying, you know, he doesn't defend backcourt players. Like how can you call um, him a backcourt player if he never primarily defends backcourt players like throughout the game? He's like, that's not his primary assignment throughout the, the season, like hardly at all. But this season, he's been guarding a lot of backcourt players. Uh, he's been guarding, you know, he shut down Dame for the most part. He locked him down that, that Sixers-Blazers uh, game that it took a vintage Carmelo performance to really get the Portland Trail Blazers, you know, the win in that game. Uh, Dame really couldn't do anything with uh, the, a guy the size of Ben Simmons uh, clamping him up, which is just, hu- that's huge. A 6'10 guy defending one of the best, I would say the best scoring point guard in the NBA right now. Um, You know, that especially come crunch time. That's just so impressive. Um, You know, we saw him defend LeBron really well um, as well when when the Sixers faced off against the Lakers and actually pulled out that that W. Ben Simmons has just been really impressive on the defensive end this season. And I think that that just counts for a lot. He might be the best defender in the NBA right now uh, this season. I would say, you know, if we're giving the award out for Defensive Player of the Year right now this season, um, I would say he's definitely in the top two. I think I'd probably give the edge to Gobert at this point just because of the Jazz uh, being a top five defense and, you know, playing the way they, they are down there and how big of a reason, you know, that, that is accredited to Gobert. Uh, it, it, I, I think that's just a little bit. It might be a little bit better of a case because you know you still got you, you still got uh, Joel Embiid here on the Sixers who has been a huge paint presence defensively, great rim protector, and Ben Simmons has been his complement on the perimeter, uh, defending everybody. So yeah, the, so Ben Simmons I would say is a little a little bit less important to the Sixers defense than Gobert is to the Jazz, and that's kind of my reasoning for that, why I'd, I'd give the slight edge to Gobert. But Ben Simmons still, I, you know, if you're wanting to lock someone down on the final possessions of a game, Simmons might be your guy, the best defender of the NBA in that regard. So, yeah, definitely a major candidate right now. I'd throw him up against Zach Levine for sure. I, I, I think I'm giving the edge thus far um, to Ben Simmons over anybody that we've talked about. Um, you know, Kyrie is one that I think maybe uh, could could give him a little bit of a, a run for his money, um, you know, when, when we're coming down to placing these guys on here. But, yeah, Ben Simmons, just because of his versatile play um, and everything he's been able to do this season, he had just had a 42-point game last night, I failed to mention, um, without Embiid on the floor. Like, that's huge. You know, scoring has really has been not where he's been doing it this season. He's really taken a back seat in terms of scoring the ball and even shooting the ball, um, which it, it seemed to work for the Sixers team. Like, it's, it's okay. They don't need him to score. Uh, he's been a very, very good uh, playmaker, especially in the open court. And defensively, he's just been otherworldly. So um, definitely going to throw him up here against Zach Levine and, and Kyrie Irving. Uh, Drew Holiday, you know, all these guys. So I think that does it for the guards, though. We're going to place down that second guard spot 
in this Eastern Conference off the bench uh, right now. And I am deciding to give it to Ben Simmons. Um, so he is the second guard here on the Eastern Conference bench. And I think I have pretty much locks for the forward spots on the bench, that being Jason Tatum and Chris Middleton. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a little bit of a drop-off after those two. You know, Jimmy Butler has had some pretty good production in the games that he's played, but he's missed a lot of games. He's only played 14 this season. You know, the Heat's record in the games that he's played is 8-6, and six, and the team record without him is 3-9. and nine. So there's definitely been a clear um, drop-off without him. It's so very clear to see why he is, in my opinion, the most important player on that team. And that's another thing I forgot to mention before about Ben Simmons is Sixers' record without him is 0-3. They've lost every single game. Ben Simmons didn't play, so... You know, his defensive impact is really showing up there for sure. But then also with other forwards, we got Gordon Hayward, who's been completely balling out this season, really kind of seeming to earn that $30 million contract that I was very surprised uh, he signed for this offseason. We also got another Heat player, Bam Adebayo, um, really taking a step forward offensively um, and still, you know, remaining one of the best defenders in the NBA, one of the most versatile as well. Uh, Jeremy Grant has been, you know, a breakout sensation with the this pretty bad Pistons team. That's really what brings him down quite a bit. But his numbers are, are really solid this year. Um, and me being a Nuggets fan as well as a Syracuse fan, Grant holds a special place uh, with me. So, but yeah, ha- kind of hard to throw him in here with all the other competition. Uh, Demontis Sabonis, you know, this Pacers team has surprised a lot of people, at least in the early goings of the season. They've been pretty cold without Oladipo, like I mentioned before, and that's hurt Sabonis' stock as well. I thought, you know, just a couple weeks ago, even Sabonis would have been a lock for me um, on this, on the bench in the East at least, but uh, I don't know uh, where he's going to end up for me um, anymore. And then we got Julius Randle as well, who deserves some, you know, discussion in here. Nick Vucevic, uh, you know, Tobias Harris, We'll, we'll get to these players a little later on. But, yeah, for sure we got Jason Tatum and Chris Middleton for our forward spots right now. You know, Tatum's been averaging 25.6 points per game, uh, 35.4 points per 100, 41, 45, 87 splits with 56% true shooting. You know, Tatum is just continuing to progress. Uh, You know, his numbers have definitely uh, gone up since last season, um, but I think he's still kind of performing around the same level, um, maybe even a little lower. Than he was in that stretch that he had towards the end of the season last year, uh, where he was just playing like a superstar. I'd like him to to see him uh, build on that a little more. He's kind of coasted at the very least through this year uh, in terms of his his development uh, from last year to this year. But definitely, you know, one of the best two way wings in the NBA um, and the offensive engine also in that. Celtic system along with uh, Jalen Brown so you know I think he deserves a spot in here Um, Chris Middleton you know continuing to be a very solid second option on offense um, alongside Giannis with the Bucks being a very efficient scorer as well Uh, you know he's in the 50 40 90 club uh, right now I just realized that I've been saying the the shooting splits uh, kind of backwards with the I've been putting a three point percentage first. Uh, for some reason, I, I wrote them down that way. I don't know why, uh, but yeah, it makes more, much more sense to put field goal first, like when you say 50, 40, 90. Um, so all the ones percentages that I've said before, just I guess go back and think about that. Um, first one I, I've been saying is, is three point percentage. Um, but yeah, Chris Middleton on the path for another 50, 40, 90 season. Uh, been a really efficient scorer as well as a really solid wing defender uh, this year. So, and you know, on one of the best teams in the East. So, I'm going to throw him in here as a lock for a forward spot on this Eastern Conference bench. The next forward spot on the bench is a really hard one for me to pick. I think I'm going to cross out Jeremy Grant for sure, and Sabonis probably, and Julius Randle. As much as it hurts me, you know, I'm. Really like all the seasons from those guys. Uh, you know, 
I was really thinking Julius Randle would probably get an all-star spot this year, but it's really it's really tough uh, when you only got 12 spots. Um, and this Eastern Conference is pretty loaded. I think there's more candidates um, in the East than there is in the West, uh, for me at least. And so I think it's really between Gordon Hayward, Bam Adebayo, Nick Vucevic, uh, and Tobias Harris, really. Th- those are the those are the four that it really comes down to for me. I think two of them will make the team for me because I think I'm going to give uh, one of my wild card spots to a guard. So I, I can only fit two more forwards on here. And so, you know, Bam Adebayo, definitely the best defender out of the bunch. Tobias Harris is shooting 50-40-90 this season. Uh, being a really solid second scorer, second option on the best team in the East. Really helping that team along. Gordon Hayward has just, you know, shown out and been such a cool story this year. Also, you know, his team is sitting at 13-13 and 13 when he's playing. You know, he, he has good shooting splits as well, good scoring numbers, good, good playmaking, rebounding, all that kind of stuff. The, the team just its a really fun dynamic on that Hornets team with Hayward really as the centerpiece of it all. But then, you know... You might be able to argue that Nikola Vucevic is more important uh, or the most important to his team when compared to Gordon Hayward or Tobias Harris, maybe even Bam Adebayo. Um, you know, Bam's really got that defensive superpower, but, but Vucevic has been lighting it up this year from beyond the arc and has been carrying that Orlando offense. Without him, I really don't know where, they, where they'd be. Oh, man, so this is a really tough one for me. I think I got to give it to Bam this last forward spot. I'm going to give it to Bam just because, you know, he's levels above these other guys in terms of defense. Scoring is really there. You know, he's averaging 29 points per 100, you know, shooting the ball well from mid range. He's really extending his range as well uh, this season. Uh, re- shooting way better from the free throw line this year than he has throughout his whole career. You know, getting to the rim, getting to the free throw line. And just locking locking players down. So, yeah, I'm going to give my last forward spot to Bam Adebayo. Um, and so then my wild card forward spot, we'll just do it while we're here talking about him. Um, man, it, I, it really could go any way. I'd, I'd honestly be very okay with any of these guys, Nikola Vucevic, Tobias Harris, or Gordon Hayward, getting this getting this final spot. You know, Tobias Harris had that had that really big game winner against the Lakers and has just been a really, really solid piece on this team that is, I, I'd say, definitely the main contender in the East. Um, unless you want to say the Nets would be the main one, but, you know, it really could go either way with for me between the two of them right now. Um, and, you know, regular season-wise, 76ers are definitely having the better year. So I th- I think I might just give it to Tobias Harris for now. Um, my my mind might change later. Um, I might regret it and want to put Vucevic or Hayward in there. But man, they they are really close. All three of these guys really close. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna give it to wow, Bam Adebayo and Tobias Harris. And that leaves the last wild card spot that I'm gonna. Um, give it to a guard, and I think that's going to be Kyrie. Um, you know, as good as Zach Levine has been this season, um, what Kyrie's been doing alongside two other prolific scores, you know, for, for this Nets team, which is the superior team for sure as compared to Chicago. Kyrie, you know, is just the higher higher pedigree of player, um, but that that's a toss up as well. I, I could. I can definitely see arguments for Levine being more important to his team, all, all this other stuff. But I think I just got to give the nod to Kyrie um, right now. So, yeah, that's my Eastern Conference all-star team. We got Bradley Beal, James Harden, Kevin Durant, Giannis, and Embiid as the starting five. Coming off the bench, we got Jalen Brown, Ben Simmons, Jason Tatum, Chris Middleton, Bam Adebayo, Kyrie Irving, and Tobias Harris. Um, so, yeah, really solid team there. Like I said, it's kind of hard to choose those last spots. Um, there are some other really deserving players in there. Um, so, 
yeah, very loosely. Uh, this is my this is what I'm locking in as my Eastern Conference All Star team. So moving over to the West, we got. I think you know there's less players in contention here, but I do have more locks. I'd say right now, and three forward spots in the starting lineup are locks, just like you know with the East. Um, they're locks in the West for me as well. And those three forwards are definitely LeBron, Jokic, and Kawhi. In that order, too, I would probably say. Um, although, you know, while I'm recording this, let me check if that Nuggets game is over. I saw that Jokic was putting up some pretty big numbers. Yep, the it is over. The Nuggets lost by 13. Um, but Jokic ended with 43. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, he scored all of those in the first three quarters. So... I guess they sat him the final minutes. Um, yeah, a really good game from Jokic. Like I've probably said in other episodes, I try not to be biased towards my own guys. And, you know, LeBron is LeBron. Um, you know, if you look at the numbers, you could definitely make an argument for Jokic. I'm not denying that. But Lakers are definitely the better team right now. You know, the, they're still the favorite to win the title, I, in my opinion, I think. So... I'm going to give the nod to LeBron as the, the main forward um, in the all-star starting lineup. And then I'll go Jokic and Kawhi. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, not going to dive too deep into these guys. You know, Kawhi's been leading the Clippers to the third best record in the Western Conference. Uh, Jokic and the Nuggets are towards the bottom of the playoffs in the in the West. We're the seventh seed right now, uh, which isn't too great, uh, if, you know, for the Nugget standards over the past couple seasons. But uh, Jokic has really been carrying the team uh, basically all season long. Not a lot of help from Murray so far. Porter has been all right. Um, but like I said, you know, when I was very upset about the offseason that we had while we were having it, um, I was kind of expecting a little bit of this. Yeah, that that's the three locks that I have for the forwards, and then I have three locks also for the guards. But which is weird, you know, because you can only have two of them starting. But I know that these three are, are going to be the best three guards um, in some order. Right now, I have the starting backcourt as Steph and Dame, but then Luca is up there as well. I'm kind of dropping him back just because of team performance, and you know everything else is really on par with Steph and Dame production wise, like individually. So. Uh, that's why I kind of give the tiebreaker to to both Steph and Dame uh, for the starting backward spots. But Luca, first guard off the bench, um, for sure. First player off the bench in general, probably. And then for the next guys coming off the bench, um, you know, pr I'll probably fill in that guard spot first. Uh, so for guards, we got, you know, Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Mike Conley, Donovan Mitchell, Shea Gilgis Alexander, uh, CJ McCollum, you know, before early in the season was definitely a main candidate. But, you know, being out with injury and everything like that has probably fallen off a little bit. Um, DeMar, I don't know if he counts as a forward as a or as a guard this season, probably as a forward. Ja, Ja Morant, even John Wall has, you know, been really impressive this season, but has not played enough games. But just thought I'd mention him. Um, Ja's also missed a good number in, of games. So I don't think I'm going to have him in here either yeah he's only played 14 games this season so definitely not including him um but yeah very very bright up and coming player in John Morant for sure um and I think I'm gonna scratch out Devin Booker as well um wait no we still got a, a ways to go I should I should keep him on here for a little bit um but yeah so I, I for the first guard spot man I think it's really between um, Chris Paul and Donovan Mitchell for me, probably. Um, Mike Conley is kind of in there as well with Devin Booker, Shea Gilles. You know, there's just, there's just quite a few, but um, I think I'm really going to only fit two of these guards on here, probably. We'll, we'll, we'll just wait and see, though. Um, but for the first guard, Chris Paul is averaging 26 points per 100 with 13 assists as well for 100 97% from a free throw line so yeah I was definitely wrong about Kyrie earlier being the highest but 
you know, and Chris Paul has been leading one of the better teams in the Western Conference, um, you know, sit, sitting in the sitting in the playoff seeds right now at number four. So, so yeah, re- really good. Um, I think we're gonna, I think I'm going to put Chris Paul here. But, you know, I, I wouldn't mind any arguments against that with Donovan Mitchell. So, you know, and this kind of gets into this argument people have been having about the Jazz, you know, them being they, they have the best record in the NBA right now and they look to be keeping it up. Also, they just seem like a really, really potent offense and defense. Uh, that's been huge with a lot of comp- contributions from a lot of different players. Um, so, you know, people have been talking about who's their best player, who's going to be representing them in the all-star game. Um, I would say, I think number one for me, for sure is Rudy Gobert. Uh, so he's going to take the, uh, f- you know, one of these forward spots on the bench, uh, for sure. I'm going to lock him in here. Definitely. He, you know, he's my pick for defensive player of the year. If the season were to end today, um, he's just, I feel like you could put just any four players with Rudy Gobert at this point, and they'd be a top 10 defense. So he's just been an overwhelmingly tremendous uh, paint presence this season. Um, and him working so much better this year uh, on the offensive offensive side of the ball uh, in a pick and roll pairing with, with uh, Mike Conley. They've definitely figured out that dynamic that they kind of struggled with last season. Uh, you know, Mike Conley kind of coming in uh, really struggling at first being incorporated into this jazz system, uh, playing alongside very different personnel than he had, than he had his entire career. You know, he's never thrown a, a lob pass, uh, in his career. I, I, uh, want to say, you know, at least on a consistent basis, uh, when he was with Memphis, you know, playing with a guy like Marcus all everything on the, on the pick and roll was definitely short roll or pick and pop, you know, um, that's just very different type, type of game than what Rudy Gobert is, which is, almost always, you know, a roll to the rim. Uh, very rarely uh, do you see him do anything else. You know, he I guess the, he will short roll a little bit uh, where they'll pass it to him towards the top of the uh, of the paint, uh, I guess, uh, when he's rolling in there and he might pass it off, off to the corner or take it right to the basket. Um, but usually, you know, it's he's finishing right around the rim uh, when, when he's getting that dump off pass. So, um, yeah, they've definitely figured that out. And that dynamic, the... Conley and Gobert pick and roll duo has been really the offensive engine outside of Mitchell's isolation scoring um, th- this season. And that's really why they've been so good. They have vi- like two different offensive, like, I don't know, weapons that they really can lean on that, you know, Conley, Gobert pick and roll with, with shooters all around it, with Royce, Royce O'Neal, uh, Bogdanovich, uh, even Mitchell when he's out there, or if not Clarkson, uh, Niang even uh, spotting up beyond the arc um, and and, t- and knocking that shot down has been really really good for them and you know Mitchell kind of they've been kind of staggering those minutes with uh, keeping Conley and Gobert on the court at the same time working together offensively and they've kind of been using Mitchell to carry the offense while they've been off the floor um, so you know that's kind of hurt Mitchell's offensive numbers I would say a little bit uh, because he would probably be a little bit more efficient. Uh, alongside Gobert, uh, using him as a in, in a pick and roll pairing more like he has in the past, but this has helped the Jazz as a team much more, using Mitchell as that uh, you know safety net to keep the their heads above water offensively on, um, you know staggering those minutes, um, kind of playing with the second unit a bit uh, during the middle of the game, and then you know Mitchell also being the guy who's taking the shot down the stretch is, uh, you know, he has a very good argument for being the best player uh, on this Jazz team. You know, I, I'd say most fans of the NBA would probably choose Mitchell just because that title usually goes to the, the main score on a team. But Gobert's just been otherworldly defensively, so I think I'm going to give the edge to him as the best player uh, right now. But I think Mitchell has to end up second. As much as I love Mike Conley and how much I think he deserves an all-star you know, selection some like at some point in his career, you know, at this point he's kind of known as the best player ever to, to never make an all-star team. And so part of me actually doesn't want to put him on here because then, you know, if he makes an all-star team, he's just another guy that made one more, you know, one all-star team. But if, if he ends his career without ever making an all-star team, he kind of lives on, you know, you know what I mean? That that's kind of part of his legacy. 
is he ends up being the greatest player to never make an All Star team. It's kind of like Lou Williams being, you know, the 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 uh, leading scorer in NBA history off the bench, or you, that that type of thing. Um, but yeah, you know, so th- there's kind of a duality to it. That, uh, but I, I really do like the guy. I think he's been underrated throughout his career, and he's having maybe the, you know, it's amongst the best seasons of his career right now, at the age of like 34, I think uh, 34, 35, uh, he's getting up there. So. Um, but yeah, definitely locking down Rudy Gobert here. And for my next forward spots, we got uh, definitely Paul George and Anthony Davis. Are the guys I'm going to lock in here for the forwards. Um, you know, Paul George is having a 50-40-90 season. Um, Anthony Davis, if uh, they do play an all-star game, probably might miss it. You know, uh, being out with that Achilles strain. I, b- I believe is what they've been calling it. Um, he might be out for a little while, maybe up like towards a month. Um, but, you know, and he's he's been kind of disappointing to me this season, kind of taking a backseat, kind of following the lead of LeBron a little bit, you know, taking a lot of possessions off, kind of choosing to turn it on when he needs to, that type of stuff. And his numbers have really suffered. His production has really suffered. But uh, as good as he is, it's it's still up there. His production, you know, is still up there to make him – uh, pretty much a lock for at least the Western Conference bench, um, but yeah, I'm I'm kind of disappointed in what I've seen from him. You know, uh, I think he is a top three player in this league, uh, up there with I'd say LeBron and and KD. Um, maybe throw Kawhi in there as well, but I think that's that's how good of a player Anthony Davis is, and we saw it in the in the playoffs and the finals last year. Um, what he can do on the defensive and offensive side of the ball. But he's he's been disappointing this year, um, to say the least, I think. But he's still Anthony Davis, so he gets a, a forward spot. Not just because he's Anthony Davis, but because of how good he is. Uh, that He's actually deserved it, I'd say, this season. As much as I kind of want to leave him off because of how disappointed I've been with him. But, I, yeah, he definitely will grab this spot. Um, and now for the wild card spots, you know, I think we, I'm going to, I'm going to throw Mitchell on here for the first wild card card spot. Um, and unlike the East, I might use both the wild card spots on guards because for forwards, we don't have much more. We got DeMar DeRozan, uh, we got Zion and we got Ingram. Um, you know, Carl Anthony Towns has only played seven games this year. That's why he's not going to be up here. Uh, but Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson, it's really hard to choose between the two of them. For me, um, they've been, have, you know, they've had really season, really similar seasons production wise. Um, oh, man. But DeMar, I think I have to give it to DeMar as much as I, I'm sorry, Mike Conley. I'm sorry. Um, I really want to see Mike Conley make an all star team. You know, half of me does like I like I mentioned earlier, but. I think I have to reward DeMar DeRozan for how good his team has been this year, how good of a glue guy facilitator he's been um, for his team this past season or this season so far. He's really been big. You know, he's been more of a playmaker than he ever has been, uh, playing, you know, pretty solid defense, uh, just, you know, everything. And the, this Spurs team has been really good, uh, you know, sitting at the – sixth spot in the West right now. So, but you know, some of that you could just contribute to just have a really good team basketball right now. Uh, and maybe, maybe this, this spot should go to somebody else. I forgot to mention De'Aaron Fox earlier as well. Um, having a really good season, him and Shay, I think are worthy of, of mentioning, you know, am I give it, I, I don't know if I'm giving it tomorrow. I, like, see, I think the West is harder than the East in a different way. I think there's a drop off. I think this last wild card spot is definitely a drop off from the other um, spots on this Western Conference roster. Like, I think if Vucevic and Hayward were in the West, I think they get this. One of them gets this spot over Demar. Probably, oh, man, it's hard. It's close, man. 
but I do think I am going to give it to DeMar DeRozan. It really could go to Mike Conley also. Um, I wouldn't mind that at all. You know, other guys, like I said, Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson, um, Shea Gilgis Alexander, De'Aaron Fox have had really good seasons also. Um, but, you know, this is that's the pain with All-Star every year is there's, especially lately, the past uh, several years, there's been a lot of guys. Um, the, the league is very deep uh, nowadays. But yeah, I think I'm going to end up giving it to DeMar DeRozan. So that means my Western Conference roster all-star team is Steph Curry, Dame Lillard, LeBron James, Kawhi Leonard, Nikola Jokic, Luka Doncic, Chris Paul, Rudy Gobert, Paul George, Anthony Davis, Donovan Mitchell, and DeMar DeRozan. Wow. So there you have it, folks. Um, I think that's going to be it for this episode. I had some other stuff I kind of wanted to dive into, but I, I already kind of talked about MVP a little bit uh, with, you know, just kind of going through these. But I'm def- definitely going to do an episode later uh, with the guys, maybe with not. I don't know. Uh, depends on, you know, scheduling when it works best for, you know, all of us. But um, I'm definitely going to make an episode talking about MVP. Um, also, I kind of want to go back. You know, last episode we had a really fun conversation about the goat of goats, the goat of team sports. Um, and I've been ever since we recorded that episode, I've been hearing a lot more discussion about it uh, from other places, and I have a lot more th- thoughts about it. And I've done a lot more research. You know, I, I made another spreadsheet in Excel. I've been making a lot of spreadsheets lately. Con- concerning sports <laughs> um but kind of just laying out a, a bunch of different statistics a bunch of different accolades things like that uh all the all the seasons of their careers kind of comparing tom brady and and michael jordan even lebron james a little bit um you know just to kind of flesh out boil out a little bit clearer of a case the, the case that i've trying been trying to make talking to you know friends over the, the past week, you know, I, this discussion has come up a, f- a few times. Um, it's been kind of awkward trying to communicate all of the things, all of the different marks over their careers that, you know, m- normal people just don't really pay attention to or know. Um, but it's really important. People just kind of have this conversation like they're on first take, like they're on one of these shows that just does it really quickly. And they're just like, yep, this is who it is. Because of this, because seven rings versus six rings and seven's a bigger number than six um, and stuff like that. Uh, so it's definitely going to, going to be in a lot more in depth uh, than just quick numbers like that. It's going to be a lot more numbers, a lot more rankings, like consensus, how like people's opinions of these players and where they've ranked throughout their career has changed. Uh, the expectations of them, how much how much um, blame and credit can be given to the players in each sport from what position they're playing, you know, the impact that they have on the game that they're playing and, and their team that they're playing with, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, really kind of diving into it more, more in depth than I've seen anybody do it because all, all these people just do it in quick little segments where they just do it very surface level to appease and uh, entertain the masses, which, uh, you know, people like to act like they care about this question but they don't they don't talk about it very deep at all i like i hear people skim over it in a sentence or they just say tom brady you know he's the goat because you know he has seven rings jordan has six or that uh tom brady's 43 and we saw jordan play in his 40s and he didn't he could he couldn't win when he was in his 40s playing with the wizards um kind of just diving into uh, I'll probably just dive into more like the comparison between what Tom Brady is doing in football with the the team that he's on right now versus what Michael Jordan was doing in basketball on the team that he was on. Um, yeah, just to kind of paint a clear picture of what really was going on and what really it means for their careers and for their legacy. So, um, yeah, be looking out for that. Uh, I'd like to get that out pretty soon start working on it pretty soon um yeah i think this is a long enough episode for what it is right now just a quick all-star thing so uh as you know 
I'm not sure exactly when all-star teams are going to be finalized, but today is the last day for voting, uh, for fan voting at least. So that's why I decided to record it tonight. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. Uh, subscribe, comment, like, you know, all, the, all that kind of stuff. Follow the Spotify feed. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. And uh, we or I, somebody, will talk to you guys next time. Mm-hmm.